anybody new coming on that's virtual, if you can uh, use the mute button and uh, mute yourself, please. And I'll jump in and help you out with your problems. <laughs> Wait, Darius, this, can you hear? This is John Pareski. Can you hear me? I'm chair of the finance committee for tonight. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, it looks like we don't have a quorum. I don't see anybody here that's on the finance committee other than me. Uh, actually, I'm here. It's just my screen isn't labeled with my name, Dave Sharp. Oh, okay. Well, there's two of us. <laughs> my, I'm I, under, uh, I'm under I, my spouse's name, Denise Schwartz. And I saw Mark Brennan, John. All right, that's three. We need one more. This is a uh, scheduled meeting of the Sunland Select Board. Please call to order at 6.05. All right, John, did you hear that? Where are the others? We have members in the audience here. Unknown is David. <laughs> I guess I I guess we can't. I guess we can't. John, do you still have your phone on? I don't um it's in the other room, might be. Yes. Is it, is it yes. creating it's havoc? Making, yes. You need yeah. to turn it off. Yeah. Give me a minute. So we are gonna open this meeting. We're gonna open a public meeting and if any Open up their meeting. Up their meeting. Do so now. Now. It's off. It's off. Does the finance committee? Who's on the finance committee? We have David. We have myself. And who else? who else? We don't have a quorum. Can you hear me? This is Brenda Doherty. I'm on the finance committee. I'm here. It's here. Okay. It seemed like you couldn't hear me. I hear you. Okay. It's been. Okay. John. Can you hear me, John? Who's this? This is the chairman of the school committee. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. You have other people in the audience that are on your team. That so you have a quorum. Okay. We have a quorum. Okay. Then I then I need to call the meeting to order and I need a roll call since the tiger. Okay. Go ahead, John. You so start I'm calling here. the meeting of the. Deerfield Finance Committee, uh, March 7th, 6.05 p.m. Please state your name so we'll know who's here. John Pareski is here. James Cavius is here. Mark Brennan here. Brenda Doherty here. Dave Sharp. Well, well, I'm, look, Brenda Doherty is... Are you new to the committee? <laughs> My second year. So this is a Deerfield committee. Oh my God. I'm on the wrong link. Oh. This was on the agenda. All right. Sorry for the confusion. Bye. Okay. <laughs> So I have, what do we have? Three people. I'm sorry, but. All right, so we have Deerfield. I think we. The Sunderland Slack Board has been called to order and is ready for the presentation. Thank you. 
Kevin. Deerfield, from what I see, Deerfield Finance Committee does not have a quorum. Yes, we do. You do. Who? David Sharp. David, Sharp. myself. Jim Cambius and Mark Brennan. There's four of you. Okay. They didn't state their name. So Mark Brennan, David Sharp, John Pareski, and Jim Cambius. We're here to represent the Deerfield Finance Committee. And the meeting's called to order. Thanks, John. John, can you mute your button now, please? Everybody's all set. We're going to have Shelly do the presentation. Okay. <laughs> We're ready. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, I don't want to belabor this, but did we call our meeting this morning? <laughs> share my screen, which is part of the course after the way that that meeting started. So <laughs> perfect. Um, for anyone that doesn't know me, I am Shelly Farida. I am the Director of Business Administration, um, and I'm going to present Frontier's budget and four town assessment to you tonight. Um, I'll stop a few different spots throughout the presentation to see if anyone has questions. If you can hold until that point, um, I'll give you plenty of opportunity. <clears throat> Um, so just a little bit of history about how the budget process starts for anyone that has not observed any of our meetings. Um, we work to develop a needs-based, student-centered, and fiscally responsible budget while we gather input from key stakeholders, consider new initiatives, as well as level services. So we've gone through multiple iterations of this budget at this point. Um, I think this is probably maybe the third time that we're reviewing this, January, February, March. So uh, this would be our final budget that we're hoping to move forward to the towns in this hearing. We did talk about new initiatives, um, included the addition of two instructional assistants, uh, brand new positions, as well as adjustments for several non-salary expenditures. Those were eliminated following the first meeting and discussion with the Frontier Budget Subcommittee. Um, because that would have increased our budget about 1% just with those new initiatives. So we felt like this wasn't the year to tackle these new tasks and that if we needed to fund additional staffing, um, we would come back to the table at another point with alternate alternative funding sources outside of the general fund. Um, so that got pulled off immediately. So what we're looking at right now is a level service budget, uh, which means that all of our existing staffing and existing programs and services are replicated for the new year. So there are, again, no new initiatives. Um, I think it's important to note that level service does not translate to level funding. Uh, there's always adjustments for wage increases that we have contracts with teachers and IAs and then non-contractual staff as well. And then uh, I don't even have to say the word inflation to anyone in this room right now. We're all feeling that, but that's taken into consideration every year. So even if we're talking about level um, services, it does not mean that we do not have an Okay, so uh, first step is always to look at our salary adjustments. So our contractual increases for teachers and IAs is at a 2% COLA for next year. There is uh, step increases as well. And if there's any column movement, so if someone advances their degree, those pieces are also taken into consideration with existing staff. And then as I said, non-contractual increases as well. So those adjustments total 232,000 which is about a 2% increase. Shelly? Yes? That number, what's COLA and what's step increase? 2% uh, is COLA. Yep. And the step averages, depending on what step you're on, 
um, between three and four percent. Between four, and that step changes with the uh, new contract, or each contract that changes the step. Correct. Yes, every year an employee steps until they hit the top of the salary schedule. And that's negotiated by who on this table negotiates that? Um, there is a group that negotiates that is decided upon by the committee. And who was that? Uh, for who? the last contract? Yes. <coughs> okay, thank you. And there's also town representatives on those committees as well. Okay, so 232,000 just in wages. So you can see 2% starting point off the bat before we get any into anything else. From there, we have to look at our non-salary expenditures. And while there aren't any new expenses in here, we are seeing costs in out-of-district placement. We're seeing increased costs in transportation, uh, retirement, insurances, and uh, facilities. And that is a total of 126,000 for FY24 another 1% increase to the budget, roughly. Uh, so the budget we're presenting tonight is 2.92% increase, which is just shy of $360,000 more than FY23. And then you can see there that we'll use about another million dollars from revolving funds and grant money to fully fund the operating budget. Any questions about those pieces before we keep going? If folks are having trouble seeing this, they do have copies ready to read. So it, was, it should have been sent out to all board members, but if you didn't have it, you need to bring one. There's copies ready to read. I have a question. Um, George? George? Yes. Yeah. Um, how many staff are you have here at the school? You're talking faculty or are you talking entire staff? An entire staff and then just faculty. Faculty, we've got about teachers, we've got about 50. Full staff, <laughs> we've got about 100. About a hundred full staff, yeah, exactly. including the cafeteria, cafeteria custodians, IAs. Anybody on the uh, virtual, if you have a question, use the little hand button, and we'll keep track of on who goes first and and your questions afterwards. You can see it. All set. Okay, so there's some uh, data here that I provided in the reports and the pie charts. Uh, the points I want to make about this is that the majority of our overall budget goes to direct education and teaching of students. Uh, so that education and leadership category is um, principal's office staff as well as teachers and IAs. You can see really clearly that another, another major chunk of this pie of our expenses is benefits and insurance. Uh, so the educational component is just about 50%, benefits and insurance is around 20%, and then it break down, breaks down from there. Uh, the other important point I think to make as part of the budget presentation, so almost $7 million of our $13 million budget is wages, and about uh, that's about 52%. And the majority of that, again, goes to educational and teaching staff. So almost 71% goes directly to teachers and IAs, anyone that is on um, those contracts that we talked about there. Questions about either of, that, either of those items? Okay. All right, don't be too far. Um, so I wanted to give you some info on historical budget increases. So last year, FY23, the current year that we're in, our increase was 3.64%. Uh, prior year, just shy of 3%. We level funded, uh, literally level funded in FY21, even though we did have increased costs. Um, if anyone remembers conversations at that time because of COVID, we had no idea what was going to happen with revenue in the towns and what the impacts of the pandemic were going to be. So district-wide, we did a 0% increase without reducing any staffing or programs. And then the prior year, 3.78%. Um, so, you know, we're around where we typically would be in a normal year. Um, and again, I just want to stress that the just shy of 3% is level services, no new initiatives. I want to make sure everybody understands that we're not asking for additional staffing, additional programming, or services. <clears throat> so I know the assessment is always the burning question because that 
2.92% uh, does not equal the assessments that the towns pay. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the revenue streams that we have, as well as how chapter 70 is formulated um, and how exactly the assessment is calculated because I wanna make sure that everyone understands those pieces. So the budget, that first step that I just reviewed is the first part of this process. We have to figure out where we are for an increase before we can go anywhere else. Um, the next step of that is to consider our revenue sources. So we have to support our general fund, uh, chapter 78 that comes in from the state, state transportation reimbursement, which only applies to regional schools, but we do see funds back there. Um, we have required town contributions, which is the amount that the state says our towns can afford to pay. We have um, additional town contributions above that to cover our budget shortfall if we do not have enough revenues. And then we have our own free cash that we use, our excess and deficiency, to support the budget. <clears throat> um, so in regards to Chapter 70, it's a very complicated formula. There's a minimal number of people in the state that understand this. <laughs> they really work at DESE. Outside of that, and there's very few at DESE that, that get it. So it's hard for any of us really to wrap our heads around this. I, I live in these numbers, I rely on the workbook, and I still can't fully explain to you how they calculate the town's wealth side of it. Um, so I would defer to your uh, town administrators to dig a little bit deeper, deeper on those pieces um, because it's not necessarily my job to analyze how wealthy the towns are. I'm just relaying to you what the state provides me for information. Um, so the goal of Chapter 70 is to ensure that each district in the state has the resources that they need to meet the calculated foundation budget through local property revenue and taxes and state aid. Um, the foundation budget, the thing that I want to point out there that's important is it includes students who reside in our district as well as students or students who reside here and go to our school as well as students who reside here but choose to go to another charter or public school. So kids that are choicing out, we actually receive revenue for those students even though they're going out of district. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, the foundation budget is made up 11, of 11 different categories that the state sets and they set the rates for those categories depending on what age the student is and that calculation comes out to what they say is our minimum per pupil cost and if you ever look at the chapter 70 workbook depending on what district you're in that number changes because the formula is comprised not only of enrollment there is um, calculations for low-income students, there's calculations for um, English language learners, there's calculations for special education, out-of-district placement, so there's a lot of components to that. But ultimately, in the end, it sets our per pupil cost. From there, the state looks at the town wealth and determines what the minimum contribution is from each of your towns as a region that you're members of. This happens at uh, your local elementary level as well. Um, <clears throat> so the income is based on property values and personal income of your residents. And I'm sorry if this is like something that everybody's heard. I just want to make sure that people understand because it is really complicated. Um, property values are not necessarily based on your assessments. They're based on the state valuation of homes in your town. So those things may not necessarily correlate. So that's something um, to look into at the town level as well to make sure that they do line up if that's how they're assessing you. Uh, and then the other piece that's even a little bit trickier, and I know that some of our school committee members can attest to this because it has impacted several of our towns in the past, is you could have a handful of really wealthy residents in your town that completely skews your numbers. So it's not necessarily a, it's Bob? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hey, I'm retired. <laughs> I have no income. The hell of the states. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, on the town end, I imagine folks are saying, we're not wealthy, 
you know, we can't afford this. We can't afford Frontier's assessment and the fire department increases and the police department increases and we have the elementary school and our own building is falling apart and the library. And, you know, there's so many components that you all are managing. And at the same time, through chapter 70, the state is saying, this is what you can afford. Um, okay, where do we go from there? So chapter 78 is then calculated so that's the difference that the state is going to cover towards our foundation budget between what the foundation budget is and the town can pay we then get in chapter 78. So that's our revenue stream for the town to cover what they say is the difference. Any questions before I keep going? Okay. <clears throat> a lot of information. You're doing great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Pat oh. on the back. <laughs> no, you're good. <laughs> Stay where you are. Um, so all of those pieces bring us back to our assessment. So we know our chapter 70 aid. Um, I want to say that our chapter 70 aid for uh, four out of five of our towns is minimal, minimum pupil increase. So when your enrollment continues to decline or stay stagnant, if we had no change in enrollment, the state does not penalize you for that decline. They give you at least what you got for, for aid from the prior year, plus $30 per pupil. Last year we received $60 per pupil because the house pushed for that. The governor's current budget only has $30 per pupil. Yes. That's for all students, including school choice mm -hmm. coming in no only resident students that go to your school and resident students that go to another school no choice we get the five thousand per pupil plus special education costs for students that choice in but that's separate from chapter seven so what does that minimal increase mean for us our budget increase at level service is three hundred and fifty seven thousand dollars we're going to see $15,000 more in increased chapter 78. So we're seeing very little increased revenue from the state. <clears throat> Transportation reimbursement. Uh, we heard that the governor may um, be pushing for 90% reimbursement rate for regional schools. Currently, the calculation on the cherry sheet shows a 75% reimbursement, which is typical over the last couple of years. 100% of that reimbursement goes to reduce the assessments to the towns. If by some chance that number grows between now and whenever you're assessed, which it has in the past, um, we would take that money, hold it in a transportation fund, and then credit you in the next possible fiscal year. So that state reimbursement is constantly going back to our four towns uh, for transportation. A uh, next revenue source for us is excess and deficiency. So the school committee has supported for several years now. I don't know how long it started before me, but at least five years, I believe, uh, to use $200,000 of our free cash to help reduce the assessment. So this year we certified $416,000 in free cash. 200,000 of that will go directly back to the four towns through the assessment as a reduction. <clears throat> the last piece of this is the minimum required contributions, which the state has set here at the 5.5 million, and then I gave you the breakdown there of the four towns. Um, <clears throat> and again, that is based on wealth and enrollment and helps contribute to our assessment factor. Okay, so our budget, uh, two point, or 12.5 million, we're receiving 8.8 .8 in revenues, including the minimum required contribution. So our budget shortfall that we're looking to fund is $3.7 million. Oh, please scroll down. Sorry, right up. All right, 12.5. I wanted just to make sure people are seeing on the paper. 12.5 total budget revenue 8.8. .8. Balance to be funded by our member towns because we do not have any other revenue sources is the 3.7. Any questions about that? Great. 
So how do we cover the 3.7 through our four member towns? So this is based on a cost share percentage, which is uh, built on a five year rolling enrollment. So you can see there the percentage points. Uh, so Conway for FY24 is 16.46, Deerfield 48.69, Sunderland 23.43, and Waitley 11.41%. So that remaining 3.7 million is then divided according to those percentage points amongst the four towns. <clears throat> Go ahead, you have a question? That uh, minimum required, or not good, the 3.7, you said 48% was due. That is uh, based on student enrollment? Yes. Okay. See this chart here, it shows you um, the five year rolling enrollment is 2296 total students over five years. Oh, I guess I can mention it. Uh, Deerfield's portion of that is 1,118 students. So almost 50% is Deerfield resident students. By our school choice uh, students shown in these enrollment figures? They're not. Okay. And then like, it was a, I, have, I received a question during the week that, what about school choice students that are in our elementary schools that choose to come to Frontier? They are not in these numbers. Okay, they're not considered, even though they've been with us the whole way, they're still considered school choice. And they have to actually re-enroll to come to Frontier. So we're a separate school district. Thank you. Yep. And just, where will, those monies be reflected in the end. School choice funds? Yeah. Uh, so I think I sent out to the town administrators, <clears throat> excuse me, a line item budget. Yeah, got okay. uh, it. In there, that there is a column that shows school choice, and you can see on the last page of that report how much we are spending on school choice from revenues received. So the district. Is that 342? 069? Yes. So we will spend $342,000 of school choice revenue on expenditures next year to help for our expenses down so that otherwise they would hit general fund. Sure. Just understanding the school choice numbers. So we have 427 students last year. How many more students are coming here? Like what's the difference in school choice? Like number of kids not in this number, but coming in. So we had a number of how many kids we take. So your your question is how many students are going out choice and how many are coming in approximately well of the 427 right because there's no school choice numbers in here there must be 50 75 kids 100 kids of school choice that come i'm just wondering what the total en enrollment total is. enrollment in frontier is 614. 614. so it's 184 difference okay um, plus we have tuition in students that aren't in that number that pay full tuition to be part of ours so we have some okay. specialized programs that um, we actually tuition like private school. Right. Twitter, Twitter I that schools. was that was an option. So okay, it is. While we're on that subject, do you have a cost per student? A what? Cost per dollar per student. <clears throat> I don't have it off the top of my head. About twenty-eight thousand. Well, no, it's kind of all over the place because I can tell you Franklin Tech is saying our cost a 16,636 per pupil. That's what they're saying. I mean, that's what they have put out in there. Right. So, of the 12.5 million general fund budget based on 614 students, yep. which does include the school choice out, it's 20,500. 
which is higher than what the state, I believe the state minimum, I don't have the chapter 70 workbook in front of me, but I think it was around 15.5 for what the state says is our minimum that we can per people spend. Right. Any other questions before we keep going? The uh, cherry sheet revenues at this point in time, that's this is what I guess we've labeled the governor's budget. Is that correct? Yes. So we haven't seen anything from either the House or the Senate. Correct. The next draft, I think, is usually out sometime in April. I think, given the current uh, makeup of the House and and said it, you're going to see an increase in those numbers. And I think the governor left room for increases in those numbers. I think we will see pure pupil go up to 60. I think we'll see transportation go up. I think there's areas that are going to pad. So when, when one person's scratching the other person's back within the same part of there. So I think you're going to see some of that. Okay. So on to the assessment. Um, I'm not going to go through each. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to read through all of these numbers. They are are here on the screen. What I will tell you is uh, the key factors. Again, that state required minimum contribution. We do not control that. That is what the state says each town can afford to pay. The other two components, the operating and the transportation, those numbers correlate back to that 3.7 budget shortfall that I described and are based on the town's cost share percentage split. Uh, so for Conway, we are seeing an increase of almost 45,000, which equates to 2.88%. Deerfield, 231,000 roughly for 5.53%. Sunderland, 191,000 for 9.14%. And Waitley is seeing a decrease in their assessment over the prior year of about 100,000 or uh, almost down 10% from the Our year. wealth went down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I retired. Yeah, I just, I'm retired. Bob retired. So I just want to hone in a little bit on um, a couple pieces that I've already talked about because we've had some questions come through the office about these various numbers. And what I want to say uh, is that the state minimum requirement is really driven for each of our towns outside of Waitley around the wealth of the town. Um, Deerfield and Sunderland in particular, Conway not as much, um, but Deerfield and Sunderland, there's enrollment decline if you look at the Chapter 70 workbook, if I'm being perfectly clear about it, that numbers are decreasing of town resident students that are coming to Frontier, at least in this year's formula. However, your minimum requirement required contribution is up significantly. So that is what is contributing primarily to the large increases in each of those towns. And again, we don't control those numbers. Waitley did have a growth. They're like the opposite here. You must have had a revenue or a, a, a tax, whether it's income or property, um, decline because you actually have growth of students in the chapter 70 workbook, but your minimum required contribution went down $130,000. So That's something with your wealth went in the reverse direction. Because yeah. Channel 22 survey from Zillow at Waitley as the number one town in Western Massachusetts for property price sales. So I, you know, I don't know where the state gets this. Yeah, I don't either, Paul. I want to go talk to them together, and maybe we can figure it out. So we, we could be in Sunderland's position next year. Oh, because everybody, everybody gets hit. Absolutely, everybody does. Every third year, I mean, come up for air. So we see you, Carolyn. She's just going to finish up, and we'll get to we'll get to you right. Okay, right. that's fine. That's fine. to this increase. I'm not denying that. But what I want to say is that when so much of the assessment is weighted on the town contribution, it's really difficult for the school committee and the administration to make additional reductions so that it has an impact on the individual towns. 
in order to bring this assessment down far enough for it to be a palatable number for Sunderland alone, we're talking about $300,000 needing to be cut from Frontier's budget. $300,000. Or 50%. Around 50% reduction. Around, we about yeah, it would probably put the assessment for them still over five, just over five, which is still a large increase. Um, Deerfield would drop down, but would still be, you know, three, three and a half. Um, Wheatley and Conway would, you know, be well below what they were in the prior year. So, um, you know, short of cutting staffing programs and services, we kind of have our hands tied at this point in. Where we are in the budget process. Carolyn, you have a question? Um, actually, I just want to let you know we are applying for a waiver. Um, we subtract the income in our 01342 zip code for all the nonprofits because that skews the 01342 zip code um, to make it the 14th wealthiest community in the um, Commonwealth. So we have been successful in getting a waiver since 2020. And I believe when we submit the information that will adjust some of our figures. And um, also we pull off on our 0173 zip code, all the income associated with Waitley addresses. And that should make a little bit of adjustment because about a third of that zip code is Waitley addresses that their income is attributed to Deerfield. So that might be fixed a little bit. Um, we're late this year. I don't, when we went to the MMA to apply, you know, and we talked about it, they, the, with the change in administration, they didn't want us to apply prior to the budget. So that's why these numbers are came out, I believe. But we are applying and the information is going in this week. It's about between the frontier and Deerfield Elementary. It's between three and four hundred thousand um, in school aid difference, I believe. Thank you, Carolyn. Yeah. Any other person? Anybody else that's virtual that have a question? Raise your hand. So I just want to mention, because Waitley does sound like they're getting off easy this year, but last year they were hit up with a $131,000 increase. And they had an 11 or 14% increase last year. So it's these crazy cycles that we're seeing within this. And um, you know, we have to, I don't know what the solution is on that. Be taking ideas. Well, I think it's out of your hands. It's out of everybody's hands. Uh, you, know, you just pretty much told what the situation is. And in some situations, and I, and I looked at the finance committee's their thoughts on that, is some situations the town has received more money. Your revenues have gone up for whatever reason. I look, think, look at Phil, when I think of Conway, the year the electrical, they put a dam or, or something in, their revenues went way up, and the state said, we'll be taking some of that and we'll be giving it to the school. So sometimes it's money in, money out, and sometimes it's not. So we don't have any idea without examining each individual town's books and going through it, which we have problems with our five budgets to go through those. Uh, so, you know, communicating on that would be helpful. Can you share so I can okay. talk about the last two pieces? So there's two other pieces of the assessment that I just want to quickly talk about. I don't think that there'll be a lot of questions or explanation, but we have a capital assessment as well. Um, that is for the tennis court restoration project. You can see the breakdown there. Uh, that assessment is also based on the cost share percentage split. So, you know, whatever we talked about before, 16, 48, 23, and we believe it was around 11. And then the next piece of the assessment is for the borrowing, which was approved years ago, that 1.8 million for the six major projects. I just want to go back to clarify. Okay. One of the tennis court projects, those who haven't been paying attention or missed it along the way, is that the school is picking up the other 200,000. And we're using school choice money to do that. So we talk about where school choice money goes. It's clearly money right off the top that's not going to the towns on other. On, on, we try to use school choice money on one time items when we can. While we're using around 300,000 to offset the budget, it's that's thing you want to use it all of it every year because it's going to go up and down, then causing greater influxes up and down to the towns. We don't want to do this. We want to do kind of one and done projects such as the tennis court. So we're kind of doing one third, two thirds, uh, two thirds, one third to the, to the towns on that. Great. Sorry. Thank you. No, I appreciate that. I forget that not everybody has heard the story 
pretty many times. <laughs> Um, okay, so last piece of the assessment is borrowing the 1.8 million that was agreed to by the four towns several years ago for the big six projects. So far, we've done uh, the track. There's been some HVAC work internally, uh, carpet, this library included. This was all changed out, a lot of flooring in the building. So far, we've borrowed 9.3 against, against that, I mean, I'm sorry, 930,000 against the 1.8 million. Um, we are currently in an interest only payment, which is why the assessments are much lower than they will be when this kicks into a, a fixed repayment term. Um, we will have to renew in July. I hope that the rates are in a better spot by then. We have one more year of interest only, and then we will have to convert this money into some type of fixed repayment plan. You can see the assessment breakdown there. And then I gave you the totals of general fund, capital, and borrowing, what everyone is looking at. So that's that. <laughs> Any additional questions? Anything that I can clarify? I don't want to snigger at John O'Connor. Hi, Alan. Well, two things. First, the current enrollment down to 614 students at the front of the original, based on the 12 million, 237,000. That works out to be just under about $20,000 per student, not including school choice, taking the full weight of about 28,600. I was referencing the fact that the school choice revenue you come in doesn't see the effects of inflation of voting. Observation. Second is with regard to the debt uh, has to amortize. The Department of Revenue now has calculator tools on strongly encourage that there be some type of a uh, stabilization fund that can help level fund the payments with a simple interest that payments will vary over a year, but to put the stabilization fund in there, you can actually have level fund payments so it'll make it easier for budget training purposes. Okay, we'll definitely look into that. We work with a broker to help us we, navigate those right. pieces. Should we repeat that for folks at home? Did you hear that already? Someone out there had. I can just hang up. No, they didn't get it. <laughs> just repeat. He was, go ahead. He was just saying that in perhaps creating a stabilization fund um, within. Well, so we have assessed the towns, so towns would create stabilization funds, but that is what they're recommending out of. DOR, did you reset? Was yes, it DOR? Official local service has a tool like that can do that too. Okay. And uh, so help level fund payments every year so the assessments can remain even rather than the amortization of the It's good to Big folks from each committee heard that, so it's great. And I see, Carolyn, you have your hand up again? Yes, I just want to say thank you very much for the tremendous amount of work you did to deliver this budget. Um, and I was hoping that we could get the four towns to write a letter um, to our legislative delegation at a minimum saying that the $30 per student is pretty ridiculous. That's like a little over 18000 And then if, even if we get $60 a student, I mean, we don't even make $37,000. So that certainly doesn't cover the kind of expenses increases that we are seeing. And um, I don't know in all your spare time, Darius, but maybe your staff can give us a list of other communities that are in this $30 or $60 group so that we can reach out and start advocating for us because we don't get any extra, whether it's pothole money or rural aid we need we we fall through the cracks and we just cannot keep um you know level of i mean you're doing level services it, our kids are falling behind because they're not making you know not able to do the things that they're doing out east so i feel like either we got to get a pro bono lawyer to help represent us and and sue the department of education for unfair funding or we got to do something that, um, you know, advocate for ourselves. So again, if we could send out letters and start 
you know, really protesting that we are not getting adequate funding. The their portion state aid is going down. There's just no question about it. And um, the other thing, just a long term, it would be very helpful if you can keep in mind looking for somebody that's objective because it's not fair. Darius, you're a wonderful superintendent. It's not fair for you to look at regionalization and uh i've been involved in two of those rounds um over the years and but we need to figure out what the optimal school choice numbers are for us um because like opeb wear and tear that kind of stuff is not built in as to what how many students we should have conversely we get because we have have these extra students we can offer more courses, we can offer better quality programs. So we need help as to what is the optimum school choice numbers for us to carry. And that would be, but we need to hire someone that is worthwhile and worth the investment that would really help us answer that question, just not some old retired person that thinks they're an expert it would tr truly should be somebody so if you could keep the school committee could keep those kind of things in mind long term that would be very helpful i think thank you carol thank you carol um i think i see another hand up and i'll go to there in a second i just want to comment to what carolyn said the um people are hearing about this soa or student opportunity act and where's all that money going and so we have a thing that was sent to us from um our uh Massachusetts Association of Regional Schools. Why don't you just read it? Okay. Uh, so according to this analysis, over 71% of all new Chapter 70 money is going to 32 districts in the Commonwealth. And there's 250 districts. Uh, three... There's 351 cities in the thousand. There's 318, according to this. 318 districts. 32 of them are getting 71% of new Chapter 70 money. So all the SOA, how they're increasing SOA, it's going to your district. Now understand, before you also wrap your head around the other side is, I believe it's something like seven districts make up almost 50% of Massachusetts population. So they're going to where the students are as well. So it's not completely crazy, but it is the formula is leaving out a lot of districts like ours um, we're not seeing increases with the increase in inflation and all the other stuff. Um, and at a time where Massachusetts is very wealthy, they have plenty of money in reserves if you have been following those conversations. Well, if we could get that list, I think it would be very helpful. We would start advocating and, you know. I can get you there. Okay, thank you, Darius. Yeah, there are, uh, according to this, 212 districts that share 7% yeah. of Chapter so some of the SOA calculation directly correlates with enrollment. So a lot of those 212 districts are like us where enrollment has declined or stays stagnant. So you're only getting the $30 or the $60 per pupil. There are some other factors in there as well, low income population, uh, English language learners, those pieces, um, but a, a good chunk of it is enrollment driven too. Sure, we have a question. We have a question screen okay. from Sunderland. I think Sunderland, we don't know who from your group there, but Sunderland administrator. Sunderland, you're up. Sunderland, you're up. Yeah, it's unmuted, so. A um, couple of quick questions. Um, the first one I had was about the um, school choice. Uh, unless we're doing our math wrong, it looks like school choice makes up about a third of the school or 30 percent ish. Um, it looks like they're only bringing in about 8% of the budget, um, unless I'm doing my math wrong. Um, is there a uh, reason why that's the case? Is that something that's um, being looked at? Is that something that we can adjust? So, yeah, we do so, look at, you're going to have to meet on your end. You're going to write the email. Um, so, we do look um, at, so, okay. I'm going to meet for you. Um, so,
so we do look at where we look at school choice where we roll out our numbers is in seventh grade seventh and eighth grade okay so we get we have our incoming class and then we see where we are um and how we can roll that out without adding sections okay now you know so the, those school choice numbers and then those numbers are carried through so if we lose some students along the way and you know we've had some kind of ups and downs with covid um, we also can lose students to tech um, going into ninth grade year so that can also cause an in inflation in those school choice numbers okay um, right now you know we were talking about uh, the actual size of frontier and we're probably going to see it looking at the numbers coming up we're going to see a decrease um, probably starting when the current fourth grade class hits frontier we're seeing a large drop and then goes up for one year, then it kind of drops again and stays steady lower. So you can see Frontier um, coming down in size. I think it's important when you look at school choice that there's a couple of factors. I know we're looking at the finance meetings, we're gonna talk about the finance side of it, but there is a, the other side of it is that we also have to pay for school choice going out, okay? So it's a game that we have to play that's full of, um, it's you know, full of politics, so to speak, um, where you wanna have substantial programs at your school Okay, we want to round out those classes so that we can have as many offers we have. If we want to do a bid budget and such as that's what you're talking about. And Karen brought a good question about an outside person coming in to look at what does it look like, um, you know, uh, looking at the finances of school choice within it and, and long term moving forward. Right now, we've been doing it as we roll out the classes, trying not to create new sections. But at the same time, you can lose sections by not having school choice. So if we have an over 100 students of school choice. Do we have a strings program? Do we have, you know, some of the, the programs that, um, do we have the amount of, you know, athletic offers? Do we have, I mean, people are leaving districts to go find those things. Do we perform musical instead of just a short, small place? You know what I mean? Do, you know, I'm not saying everything gets canceled, but the, the scale which you can do things on, and people will walk to schools that have them. You know, they will go south to schools that have them. We saw that um, when we've seen that in our own districts, um, I say districts being our elementary schools where there was a reduction of services, people left, and then you're paying out. Now it goes directly to the towns and you're paying out. So right now we are a winner in school choice as folks know, because we take in more than goes out. And we also have to offset charter, okay? And so for charter that goes out, we pay approximately $20,000 per student who chooses a charter school. Yet if a student chooses us, we only get $5,000. So, you know, it, you know, we can get down that charter role. That's just the reality of it, that we have to take four students in for every one that goes out. Um, and so, we, you know, we're looking at that number leaving too. There are other districts around us that are paying the bill for those students leaving their district before they even start the budget conversation. So there are millions going out. And that's not fair either, as folks will say that, you know, just because, you know, we see that we're on the winning side of it. We didn't invent the game. We got in the game and, you know, that's where we're at. Um, you know, some people think we should be out of the game doing that but once you're in kind of playing that game where if people are leaving and you're paying the cost unless they get rid of that side of it then we got to play the game of taking kids in so i just kind of want people to understand there's a lot more kind of going into that um we should not be having you know full sections worth of choice students um that's not the, that's not the, how we want it to be done but um, how those numbers get a little bit heavier in some of the classes it's something has to do with covid we had some kids people leave our district leave you know, homeschool and that kind of stuff. We also had students who have gone to tech. They've taken more students um, from you know, yeah. those who are watching the tech numbers. They're growing in size in Franklin County. They've taken over 100 new students, more students in their capacity over the last five years. So their plan is to grow while the rest of the, the, rest of the, uh, the county is shrinking. Don't know what the logic is on that. I ask you to talk to your school community members that are on the tech team. So, um, all right, I'll, I'll get quiet. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I'm not sure who the lady is. Go ahead. Sorry, the lady. Yeah. 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 Uh, two, two more things. Um, one, one of those is, did you have the number for what money you bring in per school choice child versus the per child cost? You said the per child cost is about 20000 per child. What do we bring in per student for school choice? So it's five thousand dollars. Five thousand dollars per student plus any special education costs that are required for an IEP. 
So if a student has a one-to-one -one aid, for example, we receive that entirely through school choice to pay for that wage. And if they receive less services, that they receive speech once a week, there's a billing increment that we receive several thousands of dollars for that, depending on what level, the length of service of each one of those things. There's a, there's basically a menu of, uh, or chart of billable um, hours for each of those kinds of things as well. So you could take, you're asking what is it, I think you're asking what the, the summary is and Shelly should, should can, um, can figure that out. And I'm sorry, Sunderland, I have to mute you after every time you speak because the feedback the room gets um, when we answer the question comes right back at us. So I have to keep muting you, sorry. So I think uh, I think you had said there were 124 school choice students on that enrollment report. Based on the cherry sheet, Frontier will receive about 1.5 in school choice tuition, which is uh, per pupil just over $12,000. So do you have Average. any others? Just in summary, it sounds like the towns are subsidizing $8,000 per student um for school choice to come in so I, I do question whether or not our our strategy of trying to attract more school choice students might be healthy for the district in terms of enrollment but i'm not sure that's healthy in terms of the burden on the towns that are and in the end of the day subsidizing eight thousand dollars per student and you had mentioned earlier that you know there's an ebb and flow to the assessments and they go up and they go down um, but this year is 9.14% for us. Last year was 7% and the year before was 14, which means the sun was looking at 30% in three years. Um, and for context, the $200,000 that our assessments went up this year is our 2.5% for top 2.5. And so that's our entire operating budget increase for this year. And I get that that's largely out of control of your hands because of the minimum you know, state assessment. Um, I just think it's important that you guys are aware a, how big of a deal this is to our budget, and B, that this is not just our year, this has been our year for three years in a row. Um, and that this is going to be a real hard hit for our township to absorb. Um, and obviously, this is soapboxing, but it does raise the question of why the state bases, the in, bases this on income when towns can't actually tax income. Um, and if one rich person being in town, the town can't turn around and say, great, give us an extra $100,000 for that person. Um, so. I, I do agree that maybe there, there's a letter writing campaign or otherwise action that the, the district should take at the state level to make sure that the, the government is aware not only of the unfairness of a lot of this, but of the just completely unacceptable. I mean, for, for just our secondary education to take our entire town budget, let alone our primary education, let alone any of our other town services, uh, really is, you know, something the state should be aware of. So I, I echo um, that concern and, and the need for that to be something that we do. Can I respond in the opposite direction on that? Do you guys know, I don't know the answer to this, but Sunderland, you do pay the lowest in taxes. My question is, does that have a factor in what the state is assessing you versus, I look at the town of Conway pays probably 6% more in taxes. Do, does that have an impact that you guys are the lowest, one of the, the, you are the lowest of the four towns, one of the lowest in Franklin County? Does that have a factor within what they're saying you have to pay versus the revenue you pull in? I don't know how that, the two work together. So I would say that given the numbers I'm looking at, it's fair to say that the state is assessing Sunderland value at a lot higher than it did last year and at a much larger increase than it's in accessing the other three towns increase. Um, so I would imagine that is part of it. Um, if we look at the numbers of what the percentages are for the four towns, um, the, the dollar per 100,000 for Sunderland went down because our average assessment went up in town. Um, and so I, I would agree that that's probably part of it. Um, but again, Prop 2.5 doesn't take that into consideration at all. Just because property values in town go up doesn't mean that we can actually collect more taxes on the other towns. Thank you. And then commenting to the person you stated that the um, that school choice is being you know is being is being backfilled or um, is being supplemented by the, the rest of the towns are paying the difference. So that's a that's a complicated it's a complicated way to say that. If I have a classroom in front of me with twelve students and I add three, how much did I just incur costs on the district? 
one could say, I didn't cost any cost there. I have to pay the teacher. I got to pay for this smart board in front of the room. I got to pay for the electricity and the heat. And I got to pay for all the insurances. I now create up, I've now increased the size of the class, which maybe actually increases the diversity and wealth of the class of what's going on in it. You know, so I think that's a, it's a more of a complicated question to just say the number of students you have in that we're paying for these students that we're supplementing that price per, per pupil when it's difficult to say that's the exact cost price per pupil. And that's why they give us that, that increment to make up the difference because that is actually more um, direct human resources that can be um, costs that can be uh, um, can be you know labeled and marked because you, you're giving a certain thing on a certain service grid. Um, so I, I just I think that's it's a little bit more complicated than just saying that you know we have more students in their choice and that necessarily means that we're paying for that dollar for dollar when actually you know I would say the opposite. Um, I think a lot of other towns in Franklin County would rather be in our situation than the situation they're in, unfortunately, due to the fact that we do have a, a rich uh, school choice population. I, I would add on to that that at the elementary level, for anyone that's on uh, an elementary committee as well, that we're having real conscious conversations about elementary or, or school choice enrollment at the elementary level and what that impact is to the elementary school and then that trickle effect to frontier um, so we're talking about it we recognize that there are town uh, folks like you as well as residents that see school choice pros and cons some hate it some love it um, and we are having those conversations did Sutherland have another question? You have to see your hand up. Yes. Uh, Darius, early, this is Tom. Earlier you made a comment about the, uh, the tax rates. The uh, Franklin Regional Council of Government just produced a study that compared tax rates, but also it compared, it looked at overall tax bills. And I would say that Sunderland, Deerfield, Whiteley, Conway are kind of on um, all of their tax rates may be lower, their average tax bills are are all within the top 10, 10 towns of Franklin County. So I, I think there's a, it's a little more complicated than just saying that your tax rates are low. I think you have to look at the total tax bills that are being generated also. Thank you. And we have somebody, I, I don't see your name up there. You have your hand Lori. up? Lori. Lori? Sorry, it took a while to get to you, Lori. Hi, no problem. I'm um, actually learning a lot every time somebody asks a question and speaks. In fact, one of my questions was answered in the last one. So thank you for that. Um, and I kind of want to echo what Sunderland had said and Carolyn. Um, and I think a lot of it, a lot of what we end up with does come back to the state. And I think um, not a lot of people realize that. They don't realize that the that you guys are just kind of working with the numbers that we have. So how do we change those numbers? And that's the part that comes from the state. So my question is kind of related to what Carolyn said. Is there any outreach from the administration and or the community to our legislators um, regarding additional funding for our schools? I know that um, there was that whole commission that Natalie um, Blay and Adam Hines uh, chaired for the rural districts. And I know that, you know, I know our um, representatives are, you know, on board with public school funding and especially, you know, in a rural community. Um, but I don't know what um, is being worked on right now with that. And if there's any outreach from us to them, um, I actually have called them in the past week or two and I'm trying to set that up, you know, personally. But um, I think it would be great if we can get anything going with that from the school and then um, if not, the, I mean, I could help gather some troops in the community, but I do think that that's another component that needs to start happening because everything that we look at this year snowballs for each year and we're getting to that, those tipping points now, like this is, this is the frontier meeting on Thursday, we have the DES meeting, which is gonna be really pretty brutal. Um, those, those conversations that we're having because we're looking at cuts, not just level. Um, so I, I think we need to, you know, really start advocating, like where else can we get funds from in a flush state? So, um, 
Good question. I did have lunch with uh, Joe Comerford on Friday, and uh, Natty Blay was there as well. It wasn't at my table, but I was set at a table. So the uh, uh, Franklin County, where actually Pioneer Valley superintendents uh, set up so that we sit down with our state legislators and talk about that. We have two state legislators that are, understand our predicament clearly. Um, in conversations with them, they are filing bills that are pro our situation. The problem is, is that we're Western Mass and they can only, they're doing the best they can to get what they can go our direction. One of the things that I asked at the um, luncheon that we had was consistent rural aid. Our rural aid is going up and down, so we can't use it in our budget year to year because we don't know what we're gonna get next year. Or we, mm -hmm. we can, and some schools are, and some schools have to. We're reluctant to use it on annual budgets because unlike some things where they can say, we'll guarantee you 50% of this next year is what I asked for. I said, just, just give us 50% of the rural aid next year so we can drop that straight into our budget, offset our budget with that. So we, we asked that, you know, um, you know, obviously they're taking notes and that kind of stuff, but that's a, a simple thing what they're doing now. Um, they're trying to get us more rural aid, as you saw with the rural aid report, those were doing um, that and they're filing bills to get more of a percentage of that and transportation costs as well um, to get 100% on reimbursement of regional transportation, which helps um, it's not going to solve the overall problems, but I kind of went to my meeting with them on Friday with like, what can I really get other than just, you know, the, the mm -hmm. kind of the cozy me's kind of deal. Um, mm -hmm. But anyways, we are doing that and our uh, superintendent group is um, you know, writing letters and doing all that other kind of stuff. So we're doing that on the administrative end. Um, there's other yeah. avenues out there. Do, do you see do you see a benefit if so you're doing the what can I actually get as the superintendent which is exactly what you should be doing and thank you um, but more community involvement and constituents going up and saying hey we're rattling this cage does that help them then go to Boston and rattle that cage no okay yeah I don't I don't, I don't know I don't know I will say that um, Joe and Natalie came on almost the same year it was one year apart They've learned a lot from us. We did a nice job of communication. Now, they, I remember their first year, it was, they probably were spinning with the request. Yeah. Now they, they have a firm command of it. In fact, I sent a note to Joe the other day and I was wrong. And she sent me a note back and said, I think you're wrong in the numbers you presented because I had, it was complaining about something. Um, and I was like, oh, you're right. So like, she's that much on top of it. We're usually, um, I would say a lot of legislators are a step behind school funding because it is so complicated. They both, uh, are shown to be very knowledgeable and mm -hmm. and are doing actually but i think you know doing what they can it, saying, is, it is really complicated and there's so many um intricacies i mean even i feel frustrated by the lack of some of the funding that we're getting that you mentioned the soa and then the fair share but the other part of me is like well where are those funds going there are probably schools that really need it like i you know i get the complexities um i just i just feel like um i I'm ner I don't want to see keep going down the road of like decrease 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 instead of like gradually increasing or or leveling and I'm just looking for ways that um we in the community um can can help or what we can do with that. Um that's a conversation I can have outside of these administrative meetings also. Um but I I hope that people in the community will keep that on the radar. Um because we all need to do something about this. Okay, that wasn't really a question, but. <laughs> Thank you, Lori. Okay, we got, thanks. We got, a, we got a couple of questions in, a, uh, in the audience, and I'll come back to the screen in a minute. Paul, were you first? Yeah. Um, this is more of a statement about some of the issues that have just been brought up here. And as we know, this is the budget meeting. This is about finances. This is about numbers. It's all very sterile. Humanity is out of this meeting as we sit here. I, I take a book from the tech school. So those guys come around, the superintendent and the fifth business manager. They come around every year. They put a program on. When they're done, they go, oh, well, okay, I get it. Their programs, what their programs are doing, what they want to do, what the future looks like, you can't say no. We don't have that here. And I strongly suggest that you interject that, whether it's the principal of the school or whether it's the school committee 
or however you want to put it together, but you put together what this school is doing and the successes this school has had, or else that little waterfall down every single year she was just describing is going to continue because the value is not being seen by the general public. Because the general public is watching this and the numbers put them to sleep. And all they see is 2%, 3%, you know, this, it has nothing to do with humanity in this building. And there is, the humanity here is everywhere. And that's my point. Somebody else have a question? Yeah, I had a question about, um, do, do we know where most of these school choice students come from? Is it, is it a particular town or is it a particular group of towns? Because that would be a, a profitable avenue for, uh, uh, you know, regionalization discussions to go towards it. I mean, you know, what percentage of, you know, if, if they're all coming from one town and it's like a significant fraction that's town students, why not bundle them in? Data, I don't have it exactly um, in front of me. I know uh, there are instances where some of our neighboring districts in Franklin County don't have the athletics or the arts offering. Some of the smaller schools, Mohawk, Gil Montague, um, we do have students coming from those areas. And then I think if you look at it, you also have students coming south from south of us too. Um, but we certainly could. The majority, the majority come from Greenfield, Montague. I think those are the two biggest sending communities. And then I think we get a, a splattering from all the rest. Imagine and being then some there. of our are going out as well for various reasons as well. Imagine being their finance committee and up there trying to figure out about school choice of paying out millions of dollars in other communities. Right. Anybody else? Okay, uh, somebody from Sunderland have another question? Oh, Karen, you take your hand down. Yeah, we have a lot. I need, I have one more question. Hold on, Sunderland. Now, uh, Carolyn, why don't you finish? Why don't you? Um, do we have a current OPEB liability figure um, offhand? I don't have that offhand. I'd have to pull the last audit. Okay. Um, I, I just think we need to keep that in mind too. Um, and then my other just request um, following up on, on the comments is that um, there is a public hearing on March 13th and I think we should submit at least some kind of letter from our four communities. And if our town administrators could work with um, Darius to put together a letter um, about this lack of funding um because rural a doesn't help us so what we need is to sort this out and long term we have to unite and advocate across the state but um i just want to say that us by ourselves isn't going to do much but we should at least submit some kind of written testimony for monday the 13th thank you carolyn yep so Sunder, do you have another question? Or you say you have Vinny? Yeah, Vinny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, Gary. This is Joe Elias. I'm on the Finance Committee and also been in education for quite a while. You give that a uh, good example of a class of 12 going to 15. That is helpful um, and makes more diversity. But when you get to 25 to 28, now you're talking about a different problem. So that's one statement. Um, and I don't know if this class size is at Frontier and what they're at, and, and if it is 12 to 15, yeah, that's, that's <coughs> richer and more diverse. But if it's, if it's getting too big, that's a problem. Second, um, I'm one of these piece of people that's on the elementary level, and um, looking at those numbers in the area are getting smaller and smaller. So luckily, we're choosing in, as you said, all these 140, 120 students helping Frontier manage a, a larger population of students, which gives us a more diverse curriculum across the board, co-curriculars and, and education curriculum. If our numbers in this area are going to keep going down for elementary, does that mean we're going to need to choice in more students to manage to keep that 600 
which is going to cost all the towns a lot more because we have less elementary school kids rising up the frontier and then we're going to have to bring in more um, choice in. And that's all the last, last bit. Ironically, because you're offering such a great program at Frontier, all these people want a choice in and they're getting a bargain because they're only, you know, we, we get five, there's a $5,000 program that we're, you know, that's choice in, but you're offering a much more diverse and um, extensive curriculum. So of course they want a choice. In. And they don't pay anything. Right. And I don't think that we're suggesting that we don't want choice kids. It's more of a question of, is there a way for us to, to look at that $5,000? Is that set by the state? Is there anything that can be done to bridge the, the five or 12, if you, if you count in the special ed um, dollars, to make it 20? Because especially if we're looking at a third of our students being school choice students, that doesn't just mean that the towns are paying $20,000 per student. That means that the towns are paying $30,000 per each of our students, and then the choicing in students are paying five. And so, you know, is, is that if we were a hotel and we had hotel rooms that were going unsold, it would make sense to fill them because even, even $5,000 is more than zero. But if we're making, you know, if we're talking a third of the school, how many entire classes is that that are, are, are only exist because of the school choice that is costing the towns, you know, $8,000 per day? Um, and do we want to be looking in the long term at a maintaining our size for the sake of maintaining our size at the expense of the budgets of the town? Or if we are looking at lower enrollment, should the district be talking about looking at a smaller frontier class size going forward and how to make that be a, a goal as opposed to the goal of just adding more school choice, more school choice, more school choice in order to not use enrollment? Which again, I get from a Darius perspective in terms of his budget and maintaining his staff and not having layoffs and all those things, but we're shooting ourselves in the foot. We're effectively selling a third of our products at under cost in order to just maintain our, our numbers. And even in the business world, that doesn't work. Um, I really think that we need to, to have a bigger discussion about what the school choice, the future of school choice is for our district. Can we find a way Either through advocacy to the state or through other programs to be able to increase that five to twelve thousand dollars, depending on how you look at it, um, up to be more close to the twenty thousand dollars. And the work we start talking about if twenty thousand dollars per student um, can can be brought down a little bit. So I did mention earlier that we are seeing a change in the population of students coming, and that the Frontier Region would be reducing probably in its size given the current population coming up in the towns. I didn't say I'd be concerned to backfill the next few years to keep us at the same size. I said we are looking at numbers with the most significant drop um, seeing with the current fourth grade class that's coming up. So, you no, know, the plan is not to continue to backfill the choice. I said we, when we look at the middle school numbers, we look at what the current number of residents are and how many we can add um, to round out that class, given it's the staffing we have without having to add additional core sections. I mean by core sections is your English, your math, your science, your social studies. You know, so we run the same number, of, we have a core number of sections for them. So, you no, know, you're going to probably see the school will have to adjust to, um, I think we've been able to stay a little bit larger than a lot of our sitting schools that have seen Franklin, the reduction in Franklin County in population. Um, maybe that'll change over time and we'll see a um, a, a baby boom of some sort, but I, I think in the next um, five, five to seven years, you're going to see Frontier probably come down um, maybe another hundred um, students or so. So, uh, you know, so in answering that question, uh, you know, the school, again, I think you're going to you have, a, you have a, the debate about school choice. Um, it, it's uh, do we have sections of students with having a third? Well, we look at each class level each grade level is how we take in school choice. So, and we allow choice in our building. You know, we could save a ton of money if we have a prescriptive and give students no choice. So if we just teach the, their schedule as such, but because we have choice of different schedules, you could technically have a class that has more choice than unchoice because more kids chose, um, you know, chose an elective, you know, creative writing elective from whatever. We don't track that internally. We track the overall class as a whole based out of the core subjects coming into middle school. So how many kids are enrolled in English class is basically what we 
is that what we do for core. Because that's what they're taking every year. Their four years are here with us. So it's a, I hear what you're saying, it's, but it's also complicated. But. I can make two additional comments if that's okay on that for school choice. So, uh, for example, based on the October 1 data, we have 25 seniors who are school choice in. We probably will replace those 25 in the various grades, but we're not seeking to grow that number. 25 is a significant number of a change year to year. So if we can bring in 25 seventh graders who may actually be from our own four elementary schools, we're about even with the outgoing class as an example. So we're not, the loss that's going out with the senior class is almost equal to what's coming in year to year. That doesn't typically grow. Um, we have some larger school choice class sizes coming up where I think we're gonna have larger numbers graduating than we have coming in. Um, and that's going to be a result of what Darius is talking about with the enrollment shift and change. One of the examples is uh, Deerfield Elementary. Lori did mention this um, and anyone that has watched those meetings, we are talking about reducing class sections because of enrollment. And that means a reduction in staffing, which reduces our budget. But that's driven by numbers. And the impact is if we only have two sections of kindergarten, we can't take school choice in kindergarten coming in. So we are having those conversations. There will be trickle effect up to frontier over the years. And I have been talking to, and we have been talking to um, all of the elementary school budgets or school committees and frontier about looking at class sizes to, making, to make sure that our budget is the right size for the students and the staffing that we have. And, and I personally believe that there is going to start to be a shift at some point because our numbers are consistently dropping year to year. Across the board, district-wide, there's gonna have to be a shift. We have a question? Yeah, just a I'll comment. come back to Sunderland in a minute. I just wanted to make a comment on what Sunderland had said. You know, when we're talking about school choice, it's important to think about fixed costs versus variable costs. You know, just because, you know, we're taking the total budget and dividing by the number of students, that's not the true cost per student. It's an average, it's, it's an indicator, it's not the actual cost. So there are times where it may appear as though we're running a deficit because we have, uh, you know, only five grand coming in, but it's actually offsetting the cost. It's, it's, it's actually like a net increase. So for everyone on the call, like it's, it's not the most intuitive thing in the world, but we, we do have to think of it in, in terms of it being like a, a very specific thing year to year in, in terms of like class sizes and the fixed cost to actually run the program. If we get a few extra kids in school choice, um, that, that, that could actually be a huge net increase uh, for, for the, the, the budget. So just wanted to let everyone know that, you know, it's complicated. Thank you. And then the final part that was said was, can we go to the state for more school choice? The state doesn't really care about school choice. School choice affects the area we're in now, the area we live here, and Cape Cod. The rest of the state does not see the numbers of students moving from district to district. In fact, the kind of the uh, suburbs of Boston and you know the, the W's and whatnot, they have very little um, exchange of students school choice wise. So um, it's really a Cape and Western Mass issue, and that's not where the political power, you're not going to see a change in school choice. Um, I don't think it's a long uphill battle. I can't say that. Sunderland, did you have another question there? Tom? Tom? Uh, Darius, just a couple things. First, um, do you know what school choice, how much came back to the towns after Ed reform back in like 1997, what school choice was? How much, how much came back to the towns? It's kind of a rhetorical question because it was $5,000 back then. So here we are 20 plus years later and we're still at $5,000. So I would say that their school choice was a much better deal for the towns back in the, the early to mid 1990s than it is now. I think we all can agree about that. I, I think that you you guys have the frontier areas and your staff have tried to manage school choice. Um, and, and to me, I, uh, 
Bob Hollow, I've been there a long time, and I see Mary Raymond's name was there a couple seconds ago. She's been there a long time, and a lot of other members also. Um, we've been talking about school choice for a long, long time, and, and this conversation is the same. But Massachusetts is a commonwealth, and definition of a commonwealth is very important. I learned that in Frontier, by the way, back in the 1975 with Mr. Heston and Mr. Barnard. And I don't see how, um, when you, you had an earlier comment about where 70% of chapter um, 70 or 71 monies are going to a very, what, 7% of the, the school districts, that's not a commonwealth. Um, that's not that's not giving our children in in our area and Carolyn earlier had said this, and I agree with Carolyn a million percent that's not giving our children the same opportunities that the children other children are getting in other parts of the state so I I don't know what you and we I don't want to say you but I don't know what we have to say but if there's anybody in rooms listen to this right now that is accepting with the fact that there's other children in other parts of the state, it's not a big state, um, that can get a better education than our children can, we should all be very disappointed and we should try, work together to try to make that inequality go away. Thank you, Darius. Is there anybody else that's virtual that has a question? Is that you, John, with your hand up? Oh, sorry. Lori, you have another question? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm going to keep it really brief. It's not a question. It's a statement that kind of, again, echoes what's being said. And if you look at where the school choice is impacting, like you said, which areas and which areas it's not, that seems um, it, it's it's not by happenstance it's intentional and it is about money and politics so we do need to advocate for more equitable distribution and not have school choice have to weigh in so profoundly in our discussions and i know everybody here has good intent and wants the best for our students we need to make sure that's happening across like you said a commonwealth so thanks for the opportunity to comment thank you Lori. i just want i just i just want to say something about school choice so I'm from Waitley. Our school size is one class per grade. And, and I've been saying it for years, thank God for school choice, because that helps our budget a lot in Waitley with the school choice numbers that are in Waitley. If we didn't have school choice, then we, ha we would have, well, we'll pick on fifth grade. Fifth grade would maybe have eight kids in it or nine kids. So in Waitley, thank God for school choice. And I remember probably, four or five years ago when, when Frontier got hit hard because of charter and stuff, it was like a million dollars in, but we also had to pay a million dollars out. So if we didn't have school choice, we would have had to pay out a million dollars for charter and not for private school, but for charter and school choice going out. So I like school choice. Um, Paul? Okay. Just a, a follow-up, I think, to Tom and to Carolyn. I agree 100%. I think everyone in this room does that the quality of education may not be equal between here and the eastern part of the state. But unless you identify those inequalities, unless we can show the taxpayer what that inequality is over time, that it will never change. And that has to happen, and that has to start here in this school and you have to sell this school you have to sell it at meetings like this when we have the voters watching and so you know we can talk about it all day long and it will only be talk unless you can show in black and white what our students are not receiving versus what others are then it's uh it's a moot point Skip, I just wanted to add a comment to what you said a moment ago. Uh, as a youngster, my father worked in construction and we moved a lot. There was one 
half a year that I spent in a little town of Harpswell, Maine. I don't know if you're at all familiar with that book. It had a grades change from eight in a three room schoolhouse. I was in grade three, and in the row that I was in there, I think there was about five of us, and then there were two other rows, grade four and grade five. For me, that was one of the best experiences that I ever had in a classroom with three grades. And you're missing out, right? You could do that. Trevor? Sure. Uh, my only comment is that I want to thank you all for the hard work that you put in to put this budget together. It's very difficult to do every year. Um, money's tight, and uh, the needs keep growing all the time. And I appreciate the work of the school committee and the administration to put together a budget, you know, and, and raise our kids. Do a good job. Teach them. Thank you. Sunil, do you have another question? I just wanted to, I just wanted to make a quick differentiation between using school choice to fill up classes and having a third of uh, six hundred you know six hundred kids be um, school choice. And at that at that point, we're not talking about filling up classes. We're talking about entire set, sections of classes that are school choice. Um, and that if we were to compare the budget with six hundred students that we have today versus a budget that just included the students from our schools and compared the per dollar amount that we're paying per student right now versus if we had no school choice, um, I think we find a dramatic difference. And I'm not advocating that we get rid of school choice. And to be clear, um, my concern here is our, our budget. I, I think school choice is a great thing. I think it's a, it's a great program, especially for students who, who want to be able to have an opportunity. And I'm glad that students from Greenfield and other school districts are able to come to our school to do that. Um, I just think it's important that we have a conversation and at least acknowledge that the bill for that is resting with the member towns. And that if what we are looking at is wanting to be able to provide an educational experience of 600 or even 800 students, that the, the, the variety of classes that it offers, I think regionalization might be the, 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 the quest, questions are asking is, rather than having Greenfield and Montague be paying us a little bit of money, we want to talk about having to be more member towns in our district so that all the towns are paying less and it's not just all coming on the backs of the four of us. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else up on the screen that has a question? Anybody else in the audience that has any more questions? We're going to close the public hearing right now and we'll start our regular meeting. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. If folks have to adjourn their meetings, they can. Yeah. We really didn't have one. Just leave it open for everyone. Can, can. Go ahead, John. Can Deerfield Finance uh, make a motion to close their meeting? I so move. Second. We have a first and second here, John. Okay. Uh, we have to say it verbally. John Pereski agrees to close the meeting. Jim County is I. Jim says I. I didn't hear him. Do we have four? Dave Sharp. Hi. Okay. Uh, Finance committee meeting is closed. Thank you. I think uh, the select board, Deerfield select board, never called the meeting. So I think we're all set. We're adjourning. That was three violations. We got to do it all over again.
Yes, I am. Hello. All right, are you guys ready for the student council report? Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Patrice Moriarty, and I'm the student council representative tonight. Uh, the first thing we're talking about is the spring musical. Uh, March 17th, 18th, and 19th are the show dates for this spring's musical Chicago. Um, I'm one of the leads, and I can confidently say that this show is going to be worth watching. Uh, the musical is a wonderful opportunity for students in the middle and, I, and high school to come together and bond. Students auditioned back in December and have been rehearsing after school every day since. Participants in the musical have been connecting with their local businesses by selling ad space in the programs, and we're extremely grateful for their support of the show. The community can show their support for the musical by spreading the word about the show and coming and seeing it. The performances are March 17th and 18th at 7 p.m. and March 19th at 2 p.m. Uh, the Student Council is supporting the Brave Schools program to integrate violence prevention into already existing school systems to promote a safe and healthy learning environment. This training will be starting in the coming months. And spring sport registration is open and it's ending in three days. Uh, students are thrilled to begin the new season. Uh, thank you everyone and have a great night. Have a good night. Can you hear me? Sorry, I can't hear you guys very well. Thank you for your report. Oh, of course, thank you. Mr. Murphy, are you on? Yes, I am. I'm sorry, can you, you're you're pretty quiet. I don't know what's going on, but permission to share my screen? Yes, go ahead. Uh, I don't have the permission. I need to you need to give it to me. Give it to me. <laughs> Oops, that was an accident. <laughs> A little plug for the uh, musical. That'd be great. That's a, a quick preview. All right, uh, hold on, let me readjust here. Okay, hopefully you see just my presentation. Uh, just say, I, I know it's a long night, and I just want to be quick about it, but uh, I want to um, introduce myself for those who don't know. Kevin Murphy, um, digital literacy computer science teacher at Frontier. Um, I've been uh, at Frontier for 15 years now. Um, prior to that, I was a Spanish teacher, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, my, my first um, uh, go at life has been uh, studying Spanish, living abroad, and that sort of thing, and that joy of travel and the joy of um, you know, exploring and, and seeing outside our, our borders has been a passion of mine. And I've been sharing it ever since I started teaching um, through EF. And that's the company um, that I'm looking to travel with. This year's, uh, or for April of 2024, uh, I wish to take students to Germany, Poland, and Hungary um, through Berlin, Prague, uh, Krakow, and Budapest. So it's a, I, I know I said Germany probably in an email, but it's, it's a little bit broader than that. Uh, really quick, let me try to move it along. All right. Um, 
a little bit about me. Like I said, I, I lived abroad, so I I lived in Mexico for two summers in high school, and that was the big, um, the big awakening, right? And every time I take students abroad, that, that I share that excitement with the students, and they get all excited about, you know, what's beyond our borders. Um, I studied in University of Seville, Spain, Sevilla. Uh, I taught high school for 11, uh, uh, 11 years of Spanish, uh, led travel through EF many times, including a frontier since I came here, uh, Spain twice, France once, Ireland and Scotland. Um, for some school committee members here, you've seen my presentations before and you heard from about my trips. Um, at least one school committee member here has a son that went on the trip with me once before. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so, um, I, I believe in uh, EF educational tours. Um, there are many other ones out there, but this, for they have the very solid backing. They've been around forever. Um, I mean, I've never had a problem with them. They're, they're terrific. So that that's their accredited and so forth. They have a great peace of mind program, especially with the recent COVID-19 and other in global situations. They have a peace of mind program to cover those, those possibilities, right? So um, if the trip needs to be canceled and that sort of thing. Um, our travel dates, I'm, I'm hoping for uh, April break. It's a 10-day tour, so it's kind of trying to stuff it into the break, April break. So I'm asking for, you know, some wiggle room on both sides of, of, of the vacation um, time. Um, we'll see how it goes. It, you know, it's hard to nail those things down. Um, my goal is to um, really align with another school in our area so that we, 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 the travel dates are locked in and we get our choices and so forth. So Southwick um, High School is looking to do the same tour. So we're kind of keeping, keeping an ear out to see how they're doing with their trip. Um, so here's our, our, our itinerary. Um, I'll try to be brief. Berlin, Prague, Krakow, and Budapest. Uh, very short um, stay in each spa uh, spot, but you know, uh, some of the best um, uh, adventures is, you know, on the bus, looking out the window and hearing um, the 24 hour tour guide actually be talking about telling stories about the area and about what they know about the area, which is, is a fascinating, I mean, it's one thing to go in and see this, you know, the cathedrals and so forth and hear all those stories and see them, but, but also to hear them consistently throughout the tour from the one tour guide. I think it's, it's a terrific opportunity. Um, and, you know, you get a good, taste of the area and then when you get older and you're in college or whatever and you want to revisit you know where to go right so it's it's kind of like a uh, a taste uh, or a taste of a durs right so you know be walking walking tour of dresden you know a lot of quick tours sightseeing of prague the castle uh cathedral the saint uh, vitus cathedral uh golden lane krakow um auschwitz which is going to be very very uh, moving um, two main camps there, um, back to Krakow, uh, let's see, the, going through the mountains, the Tatra Mountains, Budapest, Dan, uh, Danube River, the both sides of the river, Buda and Pest, um, and, you know, and a variety of excursions, some free time, some shopping, uh, just um, a great opportunity for kids to explore the world with friends, hopefully, um, or meeting new friends along the way. Um it's a great experience just to get out and, and experience those things. Um, you know, it's probably not, um, I'm not preaching to the choir here, the educational value of, of travel. Um, so I'll skip over that. The price is very low compared to other tours. I don't know if you, if other um, leaders have showed, shared pricing with you. This is a very uh, affordable for a 10 day trip. <laughs> uh, it's amazing what you can get for 10 days. Um, so I, you know, EF has always been very, very, um, reasonable with their, and, and, and it's not like they're, you're giving up anything. Their hotels are still good, but, but, you know, the, the accommodations to travel, um, and there's scholarships available and fundraising opportunities. So like, you know how you have, uh, um, GoFundMe, well, EF has a GoFundMe page that students can, you know, send out emails and try to get money from family and friends um, just as well, the same way. Uh, in addition to that, I've been a huge advocate for fundraising. I'm very aggressive with fundraising uh, for students, um, and I give credit to those who participate in the fundraising, so it's fair and equitable. Uh, we, tr we try to cover a lot of the um, extra things such as um, bus trips and, uh, or sorry, some bus trips, tips, and those sorts of things as well. Um, let's see, I think... That, I, that's a whirlwind. I hope that's enough information for you. Uh, does anybody have any questions? No one has any questions, Kevin, so we'll put it to vote. 
Need a motion, please? I'll make a motion. Second. All in favor? You too, Mary? Me too. <laughs> So go see Chicago. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Ken, you're next. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Let's tie on. Not much. All right. So my name is Ken Eckstein. Um, some of you may have seen me before and maybe not. I've only been at Frontier for the last uh, three years. Um, before that, I, I taught at Gardner High School for, for nine years, and I, I began my career in Springfield. So um, it's been a wonderful experience, and i um, looking forward to, to running my first trip through Frontier. And the, the trip that we have proposed was actually a trip that was proposed by another teacher who did a lot of work on this. And um, so I'm, I'm willing to, to carry the torch and to keep this trip going because it's a place that I've always wanted to travel. It's on my bucket list. Uh, we're talking about New Zealand. So um, the dates that we're looking at is the uh, 16th to 25th of February in 2004. Similarly to Mr. Uh, Murphy's trip, it'd be a Friday to a Sunday, a 10 day total tour. Um, and the whole emphasis of it was start in Wellington, work our way all the way up to Auckland. Um, immersive Maori cultural experience full of the history and traditions of the Maori people along with the, the beautiful New Zealand ecology. Um, exciting trip. We've got the itinerary all planned out. It's a local tour company called Haka Educational Tours. And this is a tour company. The last time that Frontier did a uh, New Zealand trip, they used the same tour company and have heard fantastic things about it. Um, so really excited to look at that. The price that we're looking at um, includes travel insurance that would cover any sickness, emergencies, um, interruptions, delayed or missing luggage, anything like that. So that's including in the total price. And we were originally hoping to, to have more students and we're gonna recruit and try to get more. We have about a half a dozen um, people interested in the trip, which would be enough to get a single chaperone to go, which would be myself. Um, I'm also looking at possibly my partner coming along. If we can't get the, if we get a 12 people to sign up, then we can have another chaperone come along with that as well. Um, but um, whether or not we have another chaperone, hoping to, to have my partner come along. We're, we're in negotiations at the moment, and uh, she is an employee of the district. Um, so in the springtime, we're planning on having some meetings um, and, and looking at some fundraising opportunities to, to help bridge the cost a little bit. The pro cost per student, we figured out, is going to be $4,500 per student. So it's a it's an expensive trip. It's on the other side of the world. Um, but the value for what we're going to be doing, I think, is really, really good. And they're going to have some fantastic experiences, some canoeing, some whitewater rafting, um, lots of Maori culture and different experiences like that up and down the island and a Hobbiton tour. I mean, who doesn't want that, right? Um, so, yeah, if you have any questions for me. No questions, Ken. Cool. Uh, do I have a motion? Second. Do I have a second? All in favor? You're going to New Zealand. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate that. Take care. Have a good night. Have a good night. All right. Let's get back to normalcy here. <laughs> About the review of the minutes from February 14th. Hold your second. Second. All in favor? Mary? Yes. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Shelly, you're next. <laughs> You want to make the night out? Yeah. I'm exhausted. <laughs> okay. 20 warrants were signed by Mr. Hala since the last meeting. The total for the record is uh, $1,236,637.14. I did send you the expense reports. 
there's no change. There's a couple of accounts that I am talking with my staff, uh, particularly in payroll, like the custodial line is way over, which I think is just because of change in staffing and payroll has to like right side itself. Um, but most of these expenses should look as they've looked uh, in the past months, as far as overages. Um, Chris sent me a question separately. Do you want me to sort of about inflation? And I sure wasn't at the time, but my, my, my question was more about how we were keeping costs relatively even while I imagine so many other things are like seven, eight, nine percent more expensive. That is true. Um, so some of the increases that we had hoped to make in the budget that we pulled out were facilities related expenses, because that's primarily where we're seeing a lot of increased costs. Some of the supplies and materials for classroom things, George did advocate for. I kept them in because they were small amounts, like 500 extra for science and math, um, because they're seeing their materials go up. Um, just for an example, but the larger facilities related things, we did pull them because even though we are seeing increased costs with inflation and in prior years, we've gone over budget in those lines. Um, I'm referring to like custodial supplies, you know, our toilet paper, our paper towels, our cleaning products, um, and then the cost to have repairs done to the building. Those are all rising, but generally, we have other savings in the budget to offset that. One easy example is the substitute teacher line. Um, especially since COVID, we have not gone over in that line item. So we can reallocate funds to the accounts that are over. So we try to find funding sources. Um, rural aid that Darius did talk about, while it hasn't been consistent and we don't want to rely on it for budget, it's also funds right now that we can use because we don't have earmark for anything else. Um, other things like insurance helps us out because some years we've had no rate change with our health insurance. So we have some cushion there. Uh, and then, you know, our free cash, the excess and deficiency that we certify comes from partially from money that we don't spend in the budget by the end of the year. So if we budget, 12.5 million and we only spend 12.4 million, that other 100,000 is sort of that kind of flexible money for us that we then dump into free cash and use for the capital projects, and for example, things like that. So that's probably way more complicated answer than you wanted, no, but, but we understand what's it going just on. gives yeah. you a little bit more detail about all those pieces. So. But everything is way up, especially building and facilities related, for sure. It's a great question. And I'm happy to take questions if anyone saw a specific line that they want to ask about or address. Did we have any questions for Shelly? Mary, you have a question for Shelly by chance? I'm all set. Okay. I want to make sure I don't forget you. <laughs> Sorry to not be there. That's all right. All right. Uh, public comment? Go ahead. So, so I just wanted to. Can you please state your name, please? My name is Allison Walters. I'm the Teachers Association president. Um, I'm just actually speaking for the students and the faculty of the school to remind everybody that in five weeks we've got three overseas trips that are going to be taking place. We've got one trip going to Spain, we've got one trip going to Greece, and we've got um, Madame Yell and myself taking 20 students to France over April break. Um, we're going to, at least for the France trip, we're going to be sending some pictures to Kevin Murphy to put on our face on, on the Facebook page for Frontier so people will get to see some of the things that we're going to be doing with students over April break this year. Thank you for the public comment. <laughs> okay. George? So I have two quick things. Uh, number one, uh, so we're getting ready for the equity audit, which is happening the week of the 20th of March. Uh, teachers have been submitting artifacts, uh, and we're going to be putting those together and sending those out to the, to the team that's doing the audit. And second, I want to publicly, I want to, I know that, that, that the paper is already, timid, already had this, but uh, I want to recognize Polly Wozni uh, for winning um, our Grinspoon Award uh, for Teacher of the Year. She's an eighth grade math teacher. She's awesome. And I want to just publicly just 
congratulate her and to make sure that she is acknowledged for the wonderful work that she's doing for our students. Thank you, George. Okay, unfinished business capital update. Very briefly, because uh, <clears throat> um, the tennis courts are currently out to bid. We did that, um, and I believe they close in the coming weeks. Um, so we'll see where we are with that. We're there for pricing, and at the same time, our boiler. Um, we do have a contracted engineer who's putting together scope and um, plans over the next uh, 12 weeks. So it's kind of the two big capital projects that we have that we just have going right now. Um, and then roofing, we're still waiting on material, but we're we're staggering that one to be not to, to come forward until next fall. So so we are three capital projects here. For Anybody have any questions on? Okay. Uh, FY twenty four push. So it's in the it's in the agenda because you have a hearing, and then you can have a chance now for you to discuss the budget. Uh, we have a meeting tomorrow night uh, to vote the budget. So this is now the, on the agenda for you to discuss the budget. Thoughts on the public hearing? Thank you, Chair. Yeah. 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 I don't have anything more to add. <laughs> <laughs> so is my question is, is everybody gonna be here tomorrow night? Okay. So you can attend you can you can attend virtually as well. And it's gonna be a I was saying to Bob, we get, it's I wanna be blunt with people. I'll be here because I, I said it was gonna be a hybrid meeting because we didn't know where we so I someone's gotta be here. Bob says he's gonna be here, but maybe I don't imagine it's gonna be a long. If you don't have anything to talk about tonight, I'm asking to be rather short. So if you want to come in remotely, just let, let me know, and then I'll make sure that we, um, you know, if you're not getting on, we find out what's going on. Right. Maybe if there's, there's only a, yeah, only if there's a few people, maybe we'll have it in your office instead of up well, here. it's supposed to be here. Okay, yeah, okay. okay. Um, so I got Missy being remote, and Bill's being remote tomorrow, then Dino now. Oh, yes. I'll be in there. You'll be here. Both you guys will be here. Okay. Keep in. Is it going to be? I guess we'll be here. I'll be here. You don't have to come. Yeah. yeah. I'll be right here. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. I only want to know it only because, like, all they're supposed to be. Ask Mary, Mary, are you going to be here tomorrow night or are you going to be remote? I'll be there. Okay. Remote? Here or there? No, in, pers in person. I can't hear you again. By the town that they come from, right? And so there's no, we're, we don't, there's nothing that we can point to that says that we're paying more money. Than I mean, I guess somebody could argue i'm just using AP as an example, but if there were an AP class with four school choice students in it and no town resident students in it, then you could technically cut that AP class and save the cost that we pay for the AP stipend. That teacher probably teaches something else as well. So you're not really getting rid of the cost of the teacher. Um, it, and that's more relevant what he was referring to at the elementary level, because there is a tipping point where if you have to add an extra classroom and you have too many school choice kids and you're adding that class just because of those school choice kids, that's not a fiscally responsible decision. Um, but here, Frontier, I think it is harder to pinpoint. There's a couple things that, because we've been looking at it, the numbers even more so, because the numbers have gone up. And, um, and I think it's because, unfortunately, schools around us are shrinking. And when you start to shrink, you start to lose programming, and then you start missing parts that, you know, that make students engaged in school, depending on who your student is and what school you're at. Um, one of the things that, 
and I've been looking at is that, so we, we make those numbers when they come to the seventh grade. The problem is that when you look at choice, how many of them are choosing to come here and then choosing private school or choosing tech? And that number comes way down. So we actually probably lose more residents on the transition from eighth to ninth grade, something we never really kind of looked at before. And we're seeing that kind of, you know, and then we also have the pandemic and stuff. We also lost some students that way as well. But um, I mean, it's kind of a complication that we can't predict where students are going to, they're going to stay with us the entire time or not. Um, and as those numbers get smaller, you know, our injury class used to be around 120. Now we dropped around, we're closer to 100, getting a little below now. And so that school choice percentage, while we kept probably near the same amount, um, you're seeing that as they, as they go into ninth grade, that is also kind of expands a little bit too. So, you know, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to reduce the number of school choice we have. We're, it, it is happening, we're having those conversations. We're not gonna fill out forever, continuing to grow that number. Um, that, so it is, it, and as Shelly said, it is difficult in the sense of, because once they're enrolled, they could go different routes and you could have a, different sections. We don't know how they're gonna go. Well, and simply at seventh grade, say there's 80 town residents from the four towns and 20 school choice. If you have 80 town residents, you're still going to have four, just simple terms, four English classes. If you add 20 school choice, that's not going to add a fifth English class. You're going to take those 20 students and divide them up. So now instead of a class of 20, it's 25, which is doable in middle and high school, it's, it's and not then, our and, class and, size. And I can, and then just go one more thing, and then within those sections, you also have special students with special needs that aren't in those sections. So you have 80 students and you have maybe six that are being pulled, or, or in the general ed class, you know, for that section, you know, so it's not easily, like some people look at number, they want to divide up and just kind of like play, play cards. It's not that simple within the schedule. But to strategically shrink the amount of number of school choice that we're going to have here, there's going to have to be close coordination with the elementary schools. What they take. So yes and no. So the thing is that you have to apply to school choice to come to Frontier. You don't automatically get in. Now we've been fortunate where we didn't, we haven't had to close school choice until um, until later in the season. You know, we open up school choice rather early, but we haven't had to close it until like May, June, where we, you know we get an extra handful after the initial group that comes in and then we have to say, uh, you know, and we've had to close school choice in middle school the last few years. So we are capping. It's not like we're saying we're taking anything we can get. We've had to cap the last few years. That's the first time. Um, but if they're choice into elementary, they automatically, no, no, no. they have to reapply in seventh grade. Yeah. Yeah. So have we got to school districts that are turning away people yeah. who have come from elementary school? Now you look at here, do we foresee that that may happen? With the, we talk about the fourth grade class kind of being that nexus point. The problem is we don't know. But it is going to happen. It's going to it's happen going to at happen. Deerfield because we're mm -hmm. reducing class sizes. And, what, and, the, and the thing where it gets even more complicated is that we're going to have to delay the school choice acceptance because we don't know how many people are coming into seventh grade. They don't, parents, you know, we get, we ask the class, we actually ask the classroom teachers to give us an idea of how many applications they filled out to go to private school. Like, oh yeah, we know that Susie and Bobby, they're both going to private school. So we kind of get an idea of what the incoming class is. But we don't know until they actually, because they don't have to, they don't have to apply to get into Frontier, they automatically get sent. So those numbers are, they're always kind of moving in, as George, you know, George, yeah. you know, say, where they shift. They shift. I mean, and some of the things that we try to do too, just we like, you know, we'll get, uh, because we do get a lot of folks that, uh, I see the, I see the biggest numbers in terms of school choice are families that are applying to come to seventh grade. Um, and we just, we just, you know, we just accept, we closed it this, this year the first, and we just accepted a large number of students, I want to say probably 10 or 11 students to come in. And, but then we have to wait and see if they're going to accept, because that's, you know, that, that's another thing that's going to shift the numbers as well. So when they get a certain number of days, I can't remember on hand if it's 30 days or two weeks or whatnot, but then we have to make more decisions based on that. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a bunch of But 10 or 11 is not a huge number when your senior class is 25 mm -hmm. school choice. So not already enrolled at the elementaries. Right. That's so it's got to be more than 10 or 11 in seventh grade. That's, yeah, those are not from the elementary. Those are outside. Okay, so yeah. Those applications coming in seventh grade, but then by ninth grade, then there's a chance there a lot of kids going to private tech schools. They go to, they go to tech schools. And then my sense of what I was seeing was that a lot of these numbers are fixed 
especially with chapter 70. And I thought it was a lot of people grasping at whatever they could grasp at to try to reduce the budget. And then school choice was the one flexible number that they could do. And then with we're looking at budget wise, those school choice numbers are so small anyway. Well, and I think Darius made a good point that I'm not sure hit everybody hard enough that we bring in enough school choice to cover our charter assessment going out. If we didn't have that, so our, our choice coming in is 1.5. Our charter going out is a million. So if we didn't have that 1.5, we'd be upside down. We'd be asking for more money potentially. And I would like to point out because I remember when we were upside down and I heard the same thing that we have to sell the school. And I think that school it has done a good job at that. And thank you, Ms. Walters, for putting the pictures and selling the school for us. Darn it. school sells itself because of what we do and how we do it. Well, yeah, I, I hear the point on that, but it's also the room school of finance people who want to know the numbers. You know, so it's a, it's a catch. I don't know how many people at home are like, oh, you know, I came to hear what, you know, what the graduation rate is at Frontier and, right. you know, those kind of things. We have those documents and it is balancing that out, you know, and it's a full time job. You know, rabbit school is a market. Yep. You know, so trying to get who's to do all that. And then what are we going to do with all those extra bodies? Increase school choice. <laughs> 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 yeah, so I've been able to the job over the years that I've been on this to turn that the way around. Sunderland has been hit, I think, the third, I think they're right there, three years in a row. They've had pretty significant, I think he said 7% last year. I don't think it was quite that high, but. No, it was uh, six last year, 14 before that, and then it was, um, it was going over negative two. It was a drop yeah. of 40. No, I'm sorry, negative six and then two oh. years before that. So yeah. it does balance itself out. It's just difficult to take those three. And I didn't mean to sound offensive to Tom on the tax rate, but I don't understand how the state says the town has to pay a certain amount. The town is only taxing a certain amount. And when we have a great disparity in the tax rate in the four towns, it gets that's what I was bringing up to people who were, who were listening. I, I, I don't under, I don't actually understand how that works. I don't understand that level of the finance. If the state says you want one hundred fifty thousand, Deerfield you want one hundred fifty thousand, but Deerfield pays more in taxes per per thousand speed or whatever the, the number is, you know, then how does that work out? That they just have to come up with more money within the lower. I don't. That's where I was kind of coming at because they are significantly lower than. Yeah, and I've read that before, where tax bill is low, the tax rate, I'm sorry, tax rate is low, tax bills are high, and I'm still wrestling with that. That, 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 that kind of mystifies me. It'd be high. Tax, tax rate versus tax bill. I paid less for my steak than he did, because I bought cheap steak, and he bought expensive steak. But the tax rate is the tax rate, the value of your house is the value of your house. I don't know how they, you know, how they're connected. How he got to that made the nexus between the two of those things. I don't, I don't understand it. Tax rate is what it is. But anyway, I was trying to clarify that if I was still off this because I, I really don't know. I was hoping maybe they do. So no changes. You're not, you're not asking <laughs> us to make any changes tomorrow morning. It is what it is. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for you. You always put together a really. Thank well you. presented, make it easy to understand. Even though it's um, well, you know, but I think you need to great detail. There's a lot of new finance community members in a lot of the towns, so I think that that was important. It was a lot. <clears throat> well, you could tell by the number of that were out there and how long we stayed. Yeah. You cheated before, so we've never had this many. Yeah. We've yeah. never yeah. had yeah. this many yeah. people show up. Never. So is it continue? <laughs> no, no. We, um, Sterile and inhumane. <laughs> That's what I thought of. Inhumane. <laughs> no humanity. Yeah, that is true. Okay, I'll set up the budget. Yes. Okay, we got a calendar coming up for the next year. First reading, sir. So yeah, basically, I'm sending the first reading out so that we can vote together at the joint committee. Right. So uh, take a look at the calendar when you get a chance. Um, we will have to build the school committee meeting calendar, but that doesn't have to be done at a joint meeting, it can be done at the individual um, So um, we'll have that put together as well. So that's why you have that time. And school committee guide. So um, you, so this started back 
I started working on this with Donna last summer, kind of um, took uh, a template from another district to kind of come up with a school committee guide because about the onboarding of new school committee members, the amount of information, that kind of stuff, and we really um, need to do that. Put it on the shelf, put it off the shelf, put it on the shelf. Anyway, so finally, I'm trying to push it out there so that we can approve it at the joint meeting. It's not a policy, so I don't know really sure if it's be approved, but just kind of being like, this is the language we want to use. Um, Jessica, who's here. Um, volunteered to be help me um, with the editing of it. Um, and if people have thoughts and ideas, you can simply send it to me and I can work Jessica, you can send it right to Jessica. Um, but it is a living document. It really is about to communicate what our, um, how we do things and even, you know, that kind of thing. And it's, it is, when you read through it, you can say this, for a new person, all those acronyms, all those acronyms and all the um, uh, different kind of stuff that we just kind of close off the tongue for many of us have been here. It's really important to get all in one place and how the system works and all that. Um, as I said to Jessica, you know, we also got to make sure it's not, you know, the rabbit hole putting everything, every single thing into it. But I think it really, something coming on board to have that will find very helpful. So um, anyway, that's the idea. I'll bring that to the joint meeting as well um, so that we know what new members are getting for training or documentation for training. Okay. Well, I was going to ask a, a couple of things and I don't know, I mean, I wish I could do this offline if that's better but one of the things actually that this guy has, has said is some of the ways to connect with uh other school committee members to get a, a little more breadth of knowledge than what we get either from this document or in these meetings and i wonder if it would be helpful you know when i when i was reading through this and you and you go to the member space it's the duties and obligation of the individual committee member it's part of that has become familiar with the general laws but so there's like this onus on hey, you've been elected to and we're going to give you this document but it's your job to go figure stuff out and maybe we should give a couple of tools to here's some spaces that might help you navigate the way you need to educate yourself about some of these things yes yeah. you know and i mesc if you've been on their website recently they just redid their website and um, that might be also where we and jessica's already started putting some links in to some of those resource pages yeah. so i think maybe we'll be more resource rich and really again i started it because a part of the onboarding process and a lot of this stuff and um you know god document is like wow we can kind of just build off this but it's not for me you know what i mean so i really do want that's why we just get volunteered to do that i was like what well, kind of volunteer she kind of i was like sure it's one of those kind of things um so but it's one of those things where i don't i sometimes forget what people need coming on too because there's you know um, so yeah, let's let's keep adding links and you know if you have suggestions and that's why I also say it's a living document that next year if we change things around or you know we add our, our new superintendency agreement or that kind of stuff we'll be putting those all those links in there as well. So um, that's the idea behind it. I mean some of the old vets probably don't need it at all. I've seen it all, but gotta uh, help the new folks come on. <clears throat> Is there going to be uh, you know? shadowing another school committee member or something like that as part of this like like a men mentor if i'm saying it right do they recommend it i i don't know but i think that that would be helpful to to have this as part of a, a new school committee member to go to some of the the subcommittee meetings so it doesn't necessarily mean they have to all right you're a new member go to all the meetings but throughout the course of your first year Let's make sure that you're involved with the finance committee meeting. Let's make sure that you have some space when the time comes to go to negotiations. Like so that you don't have to be necessarily like on the committee, but make sure that there's some well-planned space to make sure that you have like shadowing. Yeah, like like, like shadow, right? Like you start a job and you'd say yeah. these are some of the duties of your job. So let's make sure that you know how to, to right. do these duties, right? So that on Tuesday when you have to cook bacon and eggs, you're not like where's all that stuff right like so how do we make sure that we really just get every bit of the tools that we need to do to yeah does the cloud does the cloud room still offer like their first year charting course kind of uh mes yeah, yeah. right yeah they do i don't find it anywhere else. Yeah. particularly helpful for day-to-day -day stuff yeah like i mean general concepts about school cleaning but i'm not sure that it's really yeah, what goes on within. To, and some of them we're not we're not step in step with what they do, right. and right. we are a very unique district. Yes. Um, 
you know, the idea to have a mentor or someone that you know you can call to ask questions on or that kind of thing. It might be um, sometimes it happens naturally, but maybe we could like we do mentors, we do teachers. That's something we could probably think about putting together too, especially the bigger committees. You know, um, where it maybe happens a little bit more, more organically when you're in the same town because you know people coming on, or maybe not. Maybe, yeah, maybe so, it'd be perfect if. If somebody new came into the school committee in Deerfield, you could be the mentor. I'm up for re-election, please. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's the one about re-election. <laughs> <laughs> well, if someone takes your spot, you can <laughs> give them a... <laughs> That's I also forwarded it along to Din when she's showing who said, you know, this out originally. Yeah. Um, because of the MNASD conference this year, um, there was a whole workshop about the things that charting the course is more general about, but it was a little bit more specific and it was great. And it was this little like slideshow thing. And I sent that off to her. So if anyone wants that, um, I think I already shared it with some people, but um, it, it was really helpful. And there's some part you just need to have one year. You, know, you, you got to go through the whole budget cycle to understand the budget cycle. Yeah. Budget, but it's totally. like the only way to support but that. But there is, I mean, you can structure this a little more than figure it out, right? Like, I mean, we, we, oh, we have to, I think that we all can try to do better every year that just because you can figure it out and going through this doesn't mean that you can't give some tools and that first time through you have a little better understanding about what the conversation is. So they don't feel lost out there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, anything else on that? I don't have anything collaborative. Is there? Maybe coming up soon. Okay. And Darius, what do you have for us tonight? Anything else? Go. <laughs> okay. If we're not going to executive session, how about a motion to adjourn then? So moved. Second. All in favor? <laughs> See you tomorrow night. See you tomorrow night.